Zyro scientist. He's got a long career. And inter alia, he was also the one responsible for doing this exact same exercise in 2004, he tells me. So we'll see if he's got some new findings. <laughs> and Kate Forrest is a very dynamic uh, Rangelands NRM uh, all-rounder or coordinator. So she moves throughout the outback, and I'll call it the outback. And uh, so I'm, I think they're, you're in very capable hands, and I'm really looking forward to the way they're going to summarize this. Thanks very much, Pete. Uh, Kate and I are going to attempt to do this as a, as a duet, and the photograph up there is from, from uh, Sunday night, where we had the, the singers there, uh, sorry, the, the, the drummers there, the young girls. Um, they stayed pretty much in tune, and our hope is that we stay in tune uh, through this duet, which is unrehearsed. But there is a risk that you could end up going pear shaped as uh, when all the old old guys have joined the joined the band there. Uh, but we hope to stay on track. Now, our, our first we're just putting this in a number of key sort of themes, and the first one is is where Fred Cheney left off in that wonderful plenary on uh, Tuesday morning, with the quote from Howard Wooden around nudging. And, and nudging is an important thing. Oh, sorry, nudging is very important in the rangelands, uh, and uh, as we've witnessed this week in all sorts of areas, uh, particularly in, in some of the more traditional areas in, of, of the of rangelands conference uh, themes in pastoralism and conservation management, we saw that in spades. And I'll just reflect a couple of examples. Uh, Deony Walsh gave a fantastic presentation on. Uh, uh, how nudging over a 30-year period can lead to significant change. Uh, and there are other examples here with Lester Pale, and, and we saw it out in Old Man Plains and a variety of things. Uh, but the flip side on, on that partial side is Phil Holmes, where despite the fact that only a little bit of nudging is required to take people from loss to profit, it isn't happening in 80% of the rangelands. And so we'll come back to that later in attitudes. Um. I think also that, that the nudging was seen in the, some of the less traditional areas and just in the way that people go about their work. So that idea of not giving up, the nudging takes tenacity and a lot of passionate input. Um, the remote sensing people who hack and build programs on their weekend, Pia Scarf. Alan Hoggart pushing his documentary through doubting producers and non-committal committal contributors. I apologise, Alan. Kate Kessing lost $10,000 on her first show, but it was great fun. The nudging can be full of surprises and the result is a great thing. The Martu Fire video being taken up by SBS and new international distributors. And one thing we shouldn't lose sight of during the conference were the poster sessions and, and just on the nudging, there were, there were lots, in, particularly in the grazing management and, and the monitoring and the conservation uh, ecology areas around, around nudging and improved outcomes for the rangelands. Okay, so there were a lot of partnerships, physical partnerships, partnerships of information and integration, partnerships of different industries. It's a theme that you can't just knock up a partnership. Uh, it takes time, effort and commitment again. So the water sharing of the LEB, mining, indigenous pastoral management, indigenous monitoring, conservation management, and then even John James yesterday talked about e-extension and treating learning as a partnership. It's not all about the student's responsibility to make sure that the learning works. How do we build these partnerships with policy and government? And uh, just a couple of concluding notes on the partnerships. If, you, if we go back 15 or 11 years, actually, I was, I was going to put up the presentation from 11 years ago to see if you'd notice any difference, but a couple of people looked a bit older in the photo, so I had to, had to ditch that one. Um, <laughs> no, Don. To, yeah, Don. Um, but just on the on the partnering, if you go back to those some of those past conferences, 10, 20 years ago, we talked about partnering more, and nearly every one of those presentations we saw during this week, when people put up the logos at the end, there were six, eight, ten, twenty logos up there, and it wasn't just people who have contributed a bit of money. There were genuine partnerships, and it's something that's really struck me through this conference is is how that partnership model is deeply embedded. So moving on to research, and of course research is often a bit more turgid, so I've gone to text here, but um, uh, the a couple of points I want to make here, and it was referred to in the previous session, uh, Ian, Ian Watson put forward that the different, the, how research has changed through time in terms of the disciplinary nature of it, and, and particularly for the rangelands where there's so much in the way of human dimensions that we need to move much more 
uh, effectively into that multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research areas. But there's a second observation I just wanted to make is that I think we're now into a third phase of, of research approach. So we had phase one for, in the early stages of the rangelands were very top down, led by the research agencies. Um, you might occasionally go and talk to some people uh, about the work you're doing in terms of partnering. That has moved in only probably 15 years or so ago into sort of participatory action research where you work much more closely with end users from the outset. Uh, and Gay Crowley covered that pretty well in her, uh, in her presentation, that, that nature of that participatory action research. But I think we've very quickly moved into a third phase where we're, we're getting to a point in any single agency in the rangelands there is a lack, well, no critical mass now of researchers. And, in CSIRO, we're down to about a quarter of what we had nine years ago uh, alone. And so we're moving to a model now where that innovation is coming, being led by the NRM groups, Indigenous groups, uh, pastoralists, uh, other, other community groups. And the researchers are still partners in there, but we're, we're coming on invited as contributors rather than, than being the impetus. And it's a significant change. Uh, uh, the other aspect is is leading out of that, uh, uh, the change nature of the research is, is in terms of uh, integration. Uh, did you want to make that? Uh, yeah, sure. I thought um, in Ian Watson's talk and Gabriel Crowley's and a number of others, they made the point that the integration could happen at the start. If you set the project up well, people could still work independently, but you actually made sure that that information could come together. And I'm sure Gary Baston, with his years in ACRIS, would um, attribute to the advantage that that would have been to him over that time. I'm sure the amount of work that he did putting uh, just information and data from across the country that was collected in different ways and trying to work out if it would go together, it seems to overcome a lot of that problem if we get organised at the start. And just one final one. Melissa Nursey Bray made a really important point that integration ultimately needs to be an outcome and not just a process. And, uh, and I think we've still got a little way to go in getting to that. Okay, so how do we reach the other 96%? Seems to be a big question, and uh, I'll try not to talk too much on it because we did just have quite a session. Um, there was a quote in Alan Hoggart's uh, movie yesterday, his early takings on a film, and it said, It's difficult to explain if you haven't seen it, been part of it, or witnessed it for yourself. Is this what we suffer from? If you want to know what people know or think about something, it's best to ask them. He did interviews in Sydney, they were great. Um, we could use this to communicate both ways, what do city people think about the outback, and then talk to them about that, but also vice versa. What does the outback think of the cities? I'm pretty sure our answers would be as cursory. And I'm not sure where this fits, <coughs> but yesterday afternoon I was having a think about all the systems and the ways that people are doing stuff, all sorts of stuff across the rangelands. And it, came to mind that there's a massive amount of sophistication in our systems. So when uh, Claire before was talking about uh, we tend to apologise for the rangelands and the way that we work, this word sophistication came to mind. The systems that we study, the people who work across these systems, the way we're studying them and the way that people are applying them is very sophisticated. So even thinking about something that we take for granted. So the fact that Beck and Steve Cadzo are applying all of those systems. They're applying a very sophisticated number of systems together to run a pastoral property that suits their family, that's improving the environment, that's actually providing a service for the Australian people because we don't have as many dust storms. It's very, very sophisticated and they're doing it in a, a model of variability that doesn't happen in a lot of other industries or sectors. So if you had a health sector that had their, that you didn't have appointments in and all of a sudden you got a wave of patients coming through, imagine how they would cope. And that's what it's like when it rains or it doesn't rain and you have to deal with these things. And I think uh, we, we uh, undersell ourselves some, somewhat. We may be hiding under a bushel. There is a very big risk in opening our work up to a wider audience. Uh, just a couple of other comments on this this particular topic. The other 96%, which Barry Trail uh, covered uh, well in needing to reach out, but also emerge in other areas, Fiona Walsh, in, in, the, in the videos and the stories that they can tell uh, to people outside the rangelands. 
Uh, just returning this is nudging. You know, if, you, if it only takes a bit of nudging, what, what's the impediment there? And it's, it's this issue of attitudes. And we need, I think, much deeper social science uh, going on in the Rangers. We've got some going on, and, and we saw evidence of it this week. But probably, if anything, a little less than I've seen in, in, in a couple of previous conferences. And, and Nadine uh, Marshall's paper there on, on resource dependency, and getting to the bottom of what are some of the real triggers and constraints on change. We need quite a bit of more of that to, uh, to, to build in the future. So next is coping with variability. Oh, it's me. <laughs> okay. Where's five? Ah, uh, Don's paying attention. So it is number five. Um, <laughs> Come on, we only put this together today. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, boom, bust ecological. We all know the range is the highly variable nature, but it was really well highlight, highlighted in the in the sort of talks around boom, bust ecological systems. Uh, Stuart Bunn and the and the and the black hats uh, uh, at various stages in the water sharing uh, discussion. Uh, but also uh, from Jenny Silcock in, in the, the issue of can this variability in fact confer resilience in the face of management pressures and, and the issue of non-equilibrium systems uh, raise uh, or challenge some of our, our thinking there. Uh, but the key message here or challenge here is given all this variability and this noise, how do we extract, extract signal that's useful to managers and, and policy makers out of all that biophysical variability? And there's still some way to go in, in us uh, capturing that variability, understanding that variability, and using it in a way that goes beyond averages. And, and that was a message that was, was coming through. Yeah, so the Lebra guys, of, I think, were a really good example of taking science and thinking about it in terms of how people can interpret it, but then also how they can design the the advice so that decision makers don't make perverse decisions. So they make it based on a static system instead of a variable system. I thought that was excellent. The other um, example that I saw of coping with variability and um, being able to uh, build tools around that was Elise Kennedy and her foolish seasonal calendar. She was told by a botanist that if she tried to map seasonal uh, bush foods uh, around here, it was nearly impossible because of the variability. Well, I think she's shown them up. She's using technology to turn the foolish into the achievable. It's more adaptable than the old static technologies of pens and paper. It's, it was really clever. Okay, so there's been a, a lot of talk about monitoring. Uh, there was a, a long session on the, um, the use of remote sensing and how it's going coming into a, a way that we can um, access it more easily without having to have a propeller head on our doorstep. Um, but there's other monitoring going on. So there's been tweeting. This is the first Rangelands conference to tweet. And I think that Camilla Osborne had a little bit of trouble convincing some of the committee that that was necessary or useful. But the map at the bottom corner shows where people were tweeting from in Australia. There's a worldwide map. Don't get it wrong. People in London were tweeting Marianne Healy and retweeting, re retweeting her. So there's, if we think we don't have a voice, people are interested. People attached to the people we know are interested. Um, there were there were a thousand tweets, over a thousand tweets, nine hundred thousand reads, and I don't think that they're counting all the distraction from these front few rows. <laughs> I think there's uh, been there's been nudging in this that we're going from photo points to camera traps, um, which can give us constant monitoring. And now our issue is dealing with the massive amount of data that we can collect um, remotely. What a problem to have! Yeah, no, just on that side of things, I think we, we've got it's sort of revolutionary nudging that's occurring in that the uh, those remote sensing and, and remote livestock monitoring uh, aspects that is, is really generating. Uh, New ways of, of thinking about and, and describing and informing management, but but there's the challenges there. But monitoring can be also used in a cross-cultural context, and and again, Melissa, as uh, Bray gave a good example of, of that yesterday, and uh, also the uh, this morning we heard something, uh, some good examples of that uh, from the, from the KJ and and from the Central Land Council in the in the ranges. Uh, 
Uh, but there are some questions, and this actually came up in the mining session yesterday around who's going to fund monitoring in the long term. Uh, it's, it's a problem that's beset us for a long time. ACRIS wound down uh, eight, 12 months or so ago. So who, who's going to fund it in the long time? Who's going to do it? And how do we influence that as a rangeland community? And it's something that we, we need to take forward. So moving on to, to diversity, and we'll be fairly brief on this one because there really wasn't, um, we, we didn't have a lot on, on multiple use and, and, sorry, multiple use and diversity in this conference. And, and it's, a, it's a question, is it now mainstreamed? You know, do we just accept that multiple use and diversification is something that, that naturally occurs on the range? Lands? Now, in a policy sense, we're not quite there yet because governments are still dealing with, with creating the, op the opportunities for, for diversification on, for example, pastoral leases. Uh, it's happening in NT, still to happen in WA. But that said, we saw did see a couple of good examples in the mining sector again yesterday. Uh, uh, Sim Mathwin from Rio in terms of the agricultural uh, activities going on in, in, uh, in the Pilbara region and on the Andulia uh, station there on the field trip on Monday. Uh, so th there are some opportunities there and, uh, and, and perhaps it was just a, a, a reflection that they just weren't you know, just part of the agenda so much on this conference but they're out there and, and occur. Too, uh, there was there was some diversification in the way or the way we get um, we go off on tangents almost or could be taken there. So again, the, the fire management and the videos coming out of um, KJ and and the Matu, where they've now become international movie makers and stars. That's that's pretty cool diversification. Uh, the other question I'd have is whether tenure and legislation are ready to allow innovation. Okay, I get to start. I'm pretty sure Andrew just had a heart attack because he's seen the amount of notes that I've got on this page, <laughs> just in my handwriting. I promise some of it's for later. Transformative change. Uh, who knows when it will pop up? I think that was the message from Fred, was if you keep nudging along and you've got some ideas, you, you might think you know when these changes are going to happen, but you may not. It may be in your working life. It may be in your lifetime. And it may be your work that becomes transformed. But it may become transformed by another's and the changes take place. Um, but as Mr Cheney said, it comes through preparation and long-term strategy so you can capitalise on opportunities when they come up. I think also there's a, a question that the, the previous panel also talked to, which was how does our narrative link with the rest of Australia's narrative? Let's not think of it as separate from it. If we're going to transform the rangelands, the narrative has to be part of everyone's. I don't know how we do that. I think maybe we'll leave it to the guys that were all sitting at that table over there. Just a, a question I have, I guess, in, in how we how we, we bring about this transformation, and, and we, the discussion there was was pondering on that. And uh, and, and Fred on Tuesday you know, gave some examples there where you needed the visionary leadership, but there was a lot of serendipity there in, in terms of having the just the right circumstances. It might have been an electoral outcome. It's very difficult to plan for that. So how do you be ready, uh, have the leadership there, but be prepared and ready for when, when the opportunity arises? Uh, you can do all the planning and, and, and go off and, and have a planned campaign. It still fails just because the right leverage doesn't present itself. And uh, so that's, that's something we bears thinking about going forward. It also put me in mind of sitting in one of our Rangelands NRM Alliance meetings. And we were talking about writing the Australian Rangelands Initiative. And one voice set up, we, we went round and round in circles, do we do this, it's very difficult, it's very complex, how are we going to make this work? And one guy, I'm going to embarrass him, Russell Grant actually said, if we don't, who will? And if not now, when? And I think that's uh, always stuck with me <laughs> on, on that point. So... Wrapping up, the um, yeah, we don't it's, not just, it's not just about <laughs> it's not just about the sessions here at the uh, the formal sessions here at the conference. It's it's about the interactions and and the fact that yeah, you, know, you go to a lot of conferences and by halfway through day one, uh, when all the main plenaries are got, the, the the crowd thins out to about half the size. It doesn't happen at Rangeland, perhaps because we ensure there are captive audiences by Old and Burke and, and, uh, and uh, Alice brings a bit of a walk to town. So, uh, but, 
but nevertheless, I think that's only a minor factor in it. Uh, that the, the rangelands community comes together. There's something about the rangelands that gets in people's souls and in their hearts, that that brings them together and keeps them together. And it's, and it's in the formal sessions, but it's it's in the, the social events that we have. And, and uh, a fantastic job done by the organising committee in the in the social events this this week. And uh, uh, and we look forward to more of it tonight. Finally. Who else is ready for a nap? <laughs> so thank you very much.